good afternoon, everybody. We have no more seats, so this is it. Uh, I'm Professor Anna Marra, and on behalf of the Italian Study Program, I'm, I have the great pleasure to welcome you today for the inaugural Dante uh, lecture for a new initiative that starts right now at Vanderbilt. So thank you for uh, thank you everyone to be here, despite the nice weather ish outside. <laughs> and I know it's very easy to skip an event at the end of the semester, so thank you again for being here. Uh, it is also my great honor to present today's speaker, Professor <coughs> William Franke. Professor William Franke is a professor of contemplative literature at Vanderbilt University. And I'm honored to be able to call him a colleague as well as a mentor. In his long career, so this is a long introduction, <laughs> <laughs> William Franke has been a professor and head of philosophy and religious studies at the University of Macau in China a Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Intercultural Theology at the University of Salzburg, and more recently, he also became Professor Honoris Causa at the International Institute for Hermeneutics. I initially thought to present his influence and also his contribution uh, to both contemporary studies and Dante studies uh, by reading his CV. Unfortunately, Professor Frankie Curriculum Vitae is 45 page long, and I can prove it. I can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> the Italian department is paying for it. Uh, font 12, by the way, single space. And <laughs> as you can see, I'm not lying. Uh, so I'm only going to uh, mention a few points, a few facts to understand how Professor Franklin formed, informed, and inspired a new generation of scholars, not only Dante scholars, but scholars. His name among, and I quote, the three most distinguished scholar of contemporary and religious studies in the world by Stephen Morgan. He wrote 16 books uh, engaging in innovative cross-cultural and interdisciplinary research. And his epistemological and ontological approach is centered on poetry as a disclosure of truth. Since his dissertation from Canada, <laughs> Stanford University, Dante has been his author and his master, his guide, just put in there, <laughs> in understanding the basic of human nature. Dante has been at the center of his research as he traces his influence in Dante poetics forward in modern and contemporary poetry, as he did in Sacred Scripture, published in 2016, and backwards to uh, Dante's influence as he did in Revelation of Imagination, published in 2015, just to name a few. His books bridge between criticism, theory of literature, theological hermeneutics, and apophatic philosophy. He published later, and that's why I cannot read the CV, more than 160 uh, articles, whose topics span from ancient and medieval literature to modern and contemporary philosophy, theology, and culture. And more importantly, he was able to cross the boundaries of discipline, creating a dialogue between Western and non-Western culture, which I think is extremely important now. He wrote, a variety of, he wrote about a variety of authors, including Virgil, Dante, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Blake, Leopardi, Manzoni, Montale, Baudelaire, Reiche, Selene. Dickinson, Elliot, Steve, shall I, shall I keep going? Yes. I can actually, keep going. I'm gonna stop here. I also wanna point out that his scholarly work is uh, all done in text, in the text original language, which is uh, quite impressive. In fact, Professor Franklin knowledge includes ancient Greek, Latin, as well as medieval language such as Lingdok and mid, uh, middle Eye German. And I should add the actually taught literature, uh, philosophy, uh, theology in German, French, Italian, as well as English. And you speak also Spanish, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Just like me. Uh, finally, in 2021 alone, Professor Franklin published three essential monographs on Dante's poetic. The first one is The Divine Vision of Dante Paradiso, The Metaphysic of Representation, published by Cambridge University. So just in 2021. Dante Paradiso, The Theological Origins of Modern Thought, and Dante Vita Nuova and the New Testament, Hermeneutics and the Poetic of Revelation, uh, and the latter would be part of today's talk, Dante's New Life for Poetic Language as Theological Revelation in a Modern Secular Key. Because of his distinctive cross-cultural study and the diversity of his perspective, and I think I share over here today, I cannot think of a better person to inaugurate a new Dante series. So please join in me in welcoming Professor Franklin.
for that very long and detailed introduction. I think the first thing I have to do is thank Anna Mara for joining our department, our, our program here in the Italian literature, bringing this initiative, among many others, for a, an ongoing series. We, are, we launch a satellite today to see what will come of it in, in coming years with this inaugural Dante lecture. Um, and I want to dedicate this lecture actually to, to Anna as a way of formally welcoming her into our program. Thanks to all of you here to mark the occasion with us as, all, as well. Now, in the spirit of an inaugural lecture, I want to begin with beginnings, and Dante's beginnings are really with this book, The Vita Nuova. Um, we've got some, some visuals here as well. Just, uh, that's our conference, the lecture poster. This is the, the book cover. Um, the, this inaugural lecture now, I, I really do want to go to the beginning of Dante, but Dante is the, the origin, as I read it, of, of modern literature and, and culture in, in so many crucial ways. I really treated this theme of theological revelation in poetic literature far and wide, from Greek and Roman classics, through medieval literature and modern contemporary texts as well, some of which were, were just mentioned. But it really is Dante who is the, the core and origin of it, of this vision of literature as revelation. And the origin then of Dante here is in the Vita Nuova. It's very often said to be the very first book of Italian literature. And this book centers, uh, the, the very title means new life, right? La Vita Nuova. And this new life is primarily the event of Beatrice into Dante's life. But this advent conveyed by the Vita Nuova is something that could never even in principle be conveyed adequately as a prose sequence of facts even quite extraordinary facts. The work is, is hybrid. It's a, we call it a prosimetron. You can see what it looks like here. Uh, you know, alternating between prose passages and then uh, you know, intercalated, alternating with these intercalated metrical, or the prosimetron, those are the, the poems. And I think that this form is absolutely essential, really, to what Dante does, because it's only in the lyric that Dante is able to convey what it was like to encounter the Enfrice. It's an inspirational experience, and it induces an otherwise unattainable state of exaltation and even expropriation in Dante. He's not himself. It leads to a reorientation of his existence and a new exalted dimension in his experience of life. It issues then in the writing of poetry that bears witness to Dante's total transformation. The poetry that Beatrice inspires, or at least the fact that encountering her is inspirational and leads irresistibly to expression in poetry, underlies all that can be recounted about her as Dante's Beatrice. And now I'm using that word not as a proper name, but as a common noun, right? Beginning with a small letter. Beatrice means literally his beatifier, the one who blesses him and gives him bliss. So this, this epithet then epitomizes the book's argument. Dante mentions that even people that didn't know her name, they would call her Beatrice, right? automatically, spontaneously, just the experience of being in her presence made them feel beatified, and so that name came to their lips. That's how he describes it. And Dante's sense of Beatrice as his beatifier is communicated to him by his lady's greeting, her saluto, right? uh, a word which is entangled linguistically with the vocabulary for salvation. The, the idea of salvation, salute, 
which means literally health, but also spiritual well-being. In the greeting, saluto, graces or haunts the work all throughout and becomes an obsession for Dante. The, Dante's phrase, when this most gentle salvation saluted, I think it says about there we go. When this most gentle salvation saluted, you can hear that he's using the word in both senses at the same time. Right? It, the salutare is both conferring a greeting and salvation. And Dante tells us that in his lady's salutations dwell his beatitude. Appearing to Dante in the image and in the salvific role, role of Christ. Beatrice leads Dante to, and even in some sense is, the new life, la vita nuova, just as the title of the book about her declares. In this regard, Beatrice is strikingly like the one who proclaims himself the way, the truth, and the life, both protagonist and the propagator of a new and blessed life, Beatrice's name and greeting concertedly announce such quasi-evangelical good news to Dante, who in turn transmits it to his readers as effectively the, the good news according to Dante, right? Dante's gospel. Dante gives elaborate accounts of the effects of Beatrice's greeting on him as blessing and in effect saving and redeeming him. The spirit of love would destroy his own sensory spirits, the spirits in his eyes. And so that love would actually, this is medieval physiology, love would actually replace the visual or spiriti visivi, and he would be seeing her through love. He's so overcome by sentiments of charity and humility surging up in him that he can consider no one to be his enemy. That was not necessarily his normal temperament, right? As we know from his other works, he's a rather combative, cantankerous sort of character. Yet in Beatrice's presence, Dante is inhabited and inspired, and not just by a particular love passion, but by a universal love or charity, which is exempt from libido. He's transformed not only morally and spiritually, but also physically by Beatrice's greeting to such an extent that his body, under her sway, becomes as if numb and inanimate, so that he can, cannot contain his bliss. And let's see, yeah, that's, that's in this slide, in the, the part that's highlighted in, in red. Now, if Beatrice did not affect Dante in this way, so as to translate him into a new, normally inaccessible dimension of existence, she would not be Beatrice. For no mere sequence of external events without the witness of a subject, as expressed in lyrical transports, could contain the miraculous meaning which she manifestly had and was for Dante. And even the prose text, in its self-interpretive lyrical intensity, evinces and articulates this subjective grounding of its own generative event. It's a very poetic prose, and the lyrics concentrate this poetic quality, which is essential for conveying what Beatrice is, the effect that she has on Dante. And I want to say that this is, in effect, a kind of religious, that it has all of the characteristics of religious revelation. The revelation of Jesus as the Christ in the Gospels could not be given in the form merely of an objective historical fact. Instead, this revelation of divinity is inextricably bound up with the disciples' personal experience in relation to Jesus and with their lyrical, poetic expression of it in the New Testament, its hymns, prayers, psalms, doxologies. What their testimony witnesses to is a faith that Jesus inspired in them. And this faith was never compulsory in reaction to who Jesus was or to what he did. It was rather a freely willed response requiring a total commitment of self. Even when they see him at the very end of the, the gospel, on 
Mount Galilee. He had told them to go there. And they see him ascend into heaven, and some doubt it. So it's a scene that entails some kind of faith and an inner act or, or decision. The stories about Jesus witness not just to mere outward happenings, but most fundamentally to the miraculous transformations worked within the lives and hearts of the individuals who encountered him. And that does not happen without some cooperation of one's free will. Such is the deep significance of the miracle stories and the virgin birth, for example. It's what they say about the miraculous effect of Jesus of Nazareth on those who experienced him. And to make of Jesus' divinity something more objective than this is to mythologize it. In the sense of myth, and this is a neutral sense of myth, expounded by existentialist theologian Rudolf Bultmann. For Bultmann, myth is no longer a viable form of knowledge in the modern scientific age. Nothing that is not measurable in natural physical terms can be held veritably to exist in the scientific worldview. But interpreted existentially <clears throat> as expressing a form of existence, myth is not incompatible with truth. It conveys a kind of truth. Muthos, right, in, in the Greek sense is simply story. And such a sense of muthos is very much in the spirit of C.S. Lewis's dictum, the heart of Christianity is a myth, which is also a fact. By becoming a fact, it does not cease to be a myth. That is the miracle, quote from C.S. Lewis. So the fact in question here is not so much of the order of a first degree empirical fact or perception. It's rather a fact that is constructed through the commitment of a life. A life can, in fact, be built on a myth or story that is believed in and made to become the truth of an individual's existence. This unconditional life commitment occurs with varying degrees of integrity and authenticity. In such terms, the Vita Nuova can be read as Dante's founding myth, as both individual and collective aspects with communities and institutions, but there has to be a core of something that is irreducibly personal. Dante's experience of Beatrice was an experience of the miraculous and divine, of something that is beyond all finite experience of objects, and that cannot be adequately expressed in purely objective terms. This is why Dante had need of a subjective language, the language of lyric, which, apart from what it says about any specific objective referent or content, expresses feeling by form. While it is natural and fulfills certain emotional needs that Dante should express the experience of Beatrice in the hyperboles and wish-fulfilling fantasies of myth, and here, for example, when Dante, he says that Beatrice, she seemed to be not of a mortal, not the daughter of a mortal, but of God. And he makes a reference to Homer, right, and who characterized Helen in those terms. That is an admission on Dante's part that he's moving into a mythical register, right? He realizes that this is not biblical revelation, how this is. Greek and Roman myth that he's citing. So he uses hyperboles, right? She's the, the, the daughter of, of God. And this particular, this particular characterization, of course, happens to coincide with exactly what the Bible says about the Son of God um, adjusting for gender. So now, Dante's claim here, I, to be given a verifiable meaning, we have to understand it as the marvel that he felt projected onto Beatrice as witnessing to his self-transformation. Now, it's natural and it fulfills certain emotional needs that yeah. um, Dante expresses in himself this way. It's in lyrical language that he does this because the lyric, in and by its formal aesthetic properties, its musical qualities, its emotional expressiveness in excess of all representational content, is able to signify this heightened existential state. Just as in the New Testament now, 
also in the Vita Nuova, the lyric form is indispensable for expressing this experience in relation to the miraculous divinity revealing individual. Without this lyrical expression in crystallization, there would be no more than a passing individual illumination, not a historical life transforming revelation. Because the, trans the transcendent meaning of the event could not have been communicated or even formulated. The miracle of Beatrice lies in what her presence works in the hearts and minds of others, not in what is factually demonstrable about her. And this is one reason why the realistic physical detail about Christ is really lacking from the Gospels and, and also then from the Vita Nuova. We don't really know. We, we don't get detailed descriptions. We get detailed descriptions of, of what Dante sees, but not actually of how she looks. It's always her, her love-inspiring effects on him described in rather stereotypical terms that are used of all of the, the lovely women celebrated in courtly poetry. I'll give you an example of this. Um, Donne che avete un talento d'amore From her eyes, when she moves them, issue spirits of love and flame that wound the eyes of whoever beholds her right? and penetrate so that each attains the heart. You see love depicted in her face there where no one can fix their gaze. That's really about the one who is beholding her. So Dante's descriptions, they do make Beatrice an epiphany of the eternal and divine. And he really steps outside of historical experience altogether. At least he heightens and transfigures history into a super historical level of reality that's not describable in prosaic terms. And he speaks of Beatrice in her, he sees all the ends of his beatitude, tutti li termini. This is a kind of eschatological time, the time of the end, eschaton, that he's evoking. It's the obliteration of historical time. There can be no objective descriptive language to describe that. Objects are always given within the world and its parameters. But Dante's describing something that exceeds all of those parameters. But there's lyrical language and expression. And this is what Dante employs. This subjective and personal dimension, harboring the effect Beatrice had on Dante, can be conveyed only indirectly and lyrically to another person or reader. Lyrical language does this specifically by suggesting the quality of feeling or the level of intensity that was touched in the experience. And without this lyrical language, all that could be said is we had the experience, but we missed the meaning. This is T.S. Eliot in four quartets. Yet thanks to the expressive power of lyrical <coughs> language, another possibility arises, namely, and I quote Eliot again, approach to the meaning restores the experience in a different form. Now I want to consider the language of appearing and how it plays into this experience of a visionary reader. <coughs> Dante uses language of <coughs> appearing consistently. The Vita Nuova and the Christian Gospel then are both predicated on this assumption of a subjective dimension of experience which alone in which alone the deep reality and meaning of history, or of a life history, or even just of an event, can be perceived. It's a salvific meaning. And it's reconstituted both in the New Testament and in, in the Vita Nuova. It declares itself to, to memory, which can only be adequately represented as a form of witness that expresses this inner experience of the miraculous in the idiosyncratic diction of poetic language. So the, the state of excitement that Beatrice induces in Dante renders his perceptions incommensurable with any common norm, and consequently can only speak about how she appeared to him. Um, it's paranormal, enhanced, miraculous. When he discovers that Beatrice has similar effects on other men and women, as he states in his poems, like the one that was just up there. That realization simply makes those others, too, witnesses of what ordinarily 
would not be believed, for they too are beside themselves, dumbstruck with admiration and inwardly overwhelmed by an accession of virtue in their hearts. Dante is not simply reporting an act of perception of an object, so much as expressing and actualizing this episode of personal witness. He's involved in it, right? And he's involved in producing what he experiences. It questions his own being as much as, as he questions it. It's an intensely personal visionary sort of thing that he expresses with pareani, it seemed to me, consistently in these passages. And this is what I think makes the book recognized as having its visionary quality. Especially <coughs> when we consider how this language is used to modulate fluidly from the domain of perception to that of belief, and thence to a register of decision about meaning, and so finally to action, we begin to sense its value for testifying to a personal susceptibility or sensibility. It serves as witness to subjective transformation undergone in an encounter with a superlatively significant other person. And whereas typically the language of appearing qualifies as subjective and delimits the validity of perceptions that it conveys, in all of Dante's encounters with Beatrice, such language signals a superior degree of truth, the revelation of a higher reality. Now it's striking that after the death of Beatrice, in the scene where the consoling gentle lady appears to Dante, the pareami idiom, right, it appeared to me, only very rarely occurs, and it doesn't have the same valence at all. Dante simply sees, as a matter of fact, the compassionate lady. Then I saw a gentle lady, young and very beautiful, was looking at me from a window. Now it's interesting, this window as a framing device, I think, makes this an objective perception. She's an object in a frame. She's separated by the frame from Dante, the subject. So it's no longer that relationship in which Dante is totally involved. It captivates him in relation to this superlatively significant other in self-oblivion and self-transcendence. And so that's why the Pareami language, a parvene, he also uses. When he encounters the gentle lady, who is very young and beautiful, not to say tempting, he's vulnerable to seduction, precisely because he thinks of Beatrice as belonging to pastime, rather than to an immediate phenomenal appearing in the present. He says, sometime afterwards it happened that I was in a place where I remembered pastime, and I remained long in meditation and in painful thoughts. So Dante sinks here into a kind of nostalgic melancholia. And this eclipses his true vision of Beatrice's eternity and of her revelation of a new life in the present of his personal experience. He's treating her at this stage merely as a, a past fact. And by this route, he loses her, her true significance and its ultimately religious meaning. This liability to forgetting is perhaps, it perhaps inheres in framing his vision from the outside, outset as a narrative within the, the book of memory, the libro della memoria. But the book of memory's purpose is really to keep the past present uh, to his sight. The present sight of his eternally present beloved is what Dante has to recover, and finally does recover, by the end of the book, with its closing vision, after he works through this temptation with the, the other woman, he does finally come to behold the blessed Beatrice, gloriously beholding the face of him who is blessed throughout all ages. When Beatrice reappears to Dante, uh, between these two, between the episode with the, the other woman and the final vision of Beatrice, Beatrice appears to him in un imaginazione, dreams and, and imaginings. And there, we come back to this language, pareami, apartini, of the epiphanic mode. Uh, even when she's you know, appearing, she's dead, but she's appearing in dreams, she's, she's alive forevermore. Um, there, this language personalizes and subjectivizes Dante's perception. It's no longer that objective, plain seeing in the window frame. 
Now, I want to talk some about inspiration through self-reflection, right? There's a self-reflective moment in, in all of this that is intrinsic to the inspiration that Dante gives you. I think you've already been able to get to sense that this is a very self-reflective text, even you know, in, in, in what I've quoted from it. But the key turning point to subjective self-reflection in the work occurs where Dante discovers and announces his new and more noble matter, Matera Nuove Più Nobile Che La Passata. This is his matter for a poetry achieving beatitude strictly through the words praising my lady, he says. Right? This is his new his discovery, his new approach to poetry. Having no ulterior motives, this new and more noble matter is superior in that Dante can give it to himself and control it entirely, though it is still a gift from the God of love. It is simply the praise that he gives to his lady without expecting anything in return. And this makes poetry a totally self-sufficient undertaking. Deprived of Beatrice's greeting, and sh she did withdraw that from him, even during her life at a certain point. Well, his recourse then is to simply seek his beatitude in these words that praise his lady. It makes it a self-reflective and a self-sufficient circuit. He, 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 now he can really produce his own blessedness and salvation. And, and yet, even though it's a perfectly self-referential system, it's all wholly directed toward this inspiring other. Right, Dante stages a close correlation between his own self-reflection and his being inspired from beyond himself, his being beholden to this mysterious otherness in his description of how he comes to this original style of praise poetry. He's made to stop and reflect by the fact of his own consternation about how to answer ladies who mock him. They see he's being destroyed by love. And he goes through these episodes of the gabbo, right, the, the, the mockery. He's really humiliated. And this causes him to retreat into a kind of reflect, you know, reflecting much for several days, conversing with himself. And then he comes to this insight. Uh, that he's going to seek his blessedness in nothing other than the words that praise his lady. And how does this come to him, however? It comes really as a, a kind of inspiration. Um, then it happens, you know, walking by a clear stream. Is that what happened? Walking. Yeah, by a clear stream. And what's a clear stream if not a, a, a symbol for poetic inspiration? Mm -hmm. Dante is overwhelmed by a spontaneous upsurge of words. His tongue speaks as if of its own accord, spontaneously. It, and enunciates the incipit of his breakthrough poem, this ladies who have intelligence of love. Dante's experience of the new life and of a miracle in the presence of Beatrice, experienced as wholly other than, and than any ordinary presence, comes to him as given from beyond himself. And yet striking in these descriptions is how this experience of otherness is yoked to his own conscious practice of self-reflection and to the discovery of a new technique for his art. A revelation from above and beyond him goes hand in hand with Dante's own disciplined creation and deliberate cultivation of his poetic craft. After receiving this inspired incipit, the beginning of that poem, he spent several more days reflecting before writing the canzone. And you know, it's really then this revelation is all worked in and through reflection. It comes to him concretely, I think, on the basis of this reflection. In any case, Dante is very much emphasizing how, how they coincide, they, they, they really um, come penetrate. I, I want to speak of a hybridization here, inspiration and reflection. And this is really the whole story, I would like to suggest, of, of modern literature. And this particular instance then has immense inaugural significance. The whole, whole historical destiny of literary craft and inspiration to take up the relay from religion in revealing to us 
our deeper reality as something inscrutably other than in excess of our consciously known selves, I think comes to a, a first expression here in this book. Paradoxically, Dante's prescription for a poetry that would be perfectly self-referential is wholly turned toward transcendence in both an erotic and a religious sense. His strategy is to make the poetry its own fulfillment in a self-reflexive movement, and yet it can accomplish this only by incorporating and transmitting its transcendent inspiration, namely Beatrice, as its central focus. Dante constantly plays up the role of reflection in extending the inspiration wrought by Beatrice beyond her death through his own reflective remembrance of her. He notes that Beatrice, that not only her presence, but also the memory of her, in his thought, worked miracles and operated efficaciously. By this route, his reflection can make itself independent of her actual presence. And a telling example of this is on the anniversary of Beatrice's death, this is in chapter 34, Dante is plunged deep into thought while designing angels, right? He's meditating on, on Beatrice. And his meditation becomes something, again, of a visitation from above. He suddenly becomes aware that there are of the unaccountable presence before him of men to whom honor was due startling Dante out of his musings. They recall the three men honored as guests by Abraham at Mamre in Genesis and traditionally interpreted as a theophany of the Holy Trinity. This episode on the anniversary of Beatrice's death illustrates how memorialization, or what is often called recollection in a certain religious vocabulary, can function as a sacred rite and accomplish a sort of revelation through self-reflection reflective processes of ceremonial remembrance that are important constituents of religious rites and cults. Memorialization, paradoxically, makes divinity <coughs> present, but as absent. Right? Images produced by one's own reflections supply an ersatz, some kind of a substitute for the holy other. Right? This is what we, we have in religious rite. Rigorous and profound reflection reveals the transcendent nature of the deity to be ungraspable in whatever concrete finite forms. It's infinite. Um, reflection exposes a necessary emptiness, which then opens a space for the infinite or holy. Humanly, it can be filled through relationships with others and acts of love and service. Medieval pilgrimage rites, proceeding paradigmatically to an empty tomb, offer a liturgical performance of such reflective or recollective work. Liturgos is, is the Greek, the work of the people, actually. The very emptiness of a positive physical presence turns commemorative religious rites in the direction of an openness to others and to inspiration, which may even be understood to be divine. Now, finally, I want to look at some enigmatic symptoms um, that expose this predicament of the subject that we're discovering here in Dante, in his first, in his Vita Nuova. So, the, the first enigmatic fe um, feature that I would point to as a way, of, as showing us how Dante discovers, really, through self-reflective subjectivity, this infinite abyss that opens him outward towards an unspeakable other. I think the, the, the first thing that, that calls this to mind is a kind of secretiveness on his part. He doesn't want to divulge the name of the one he loves. It becomes obvious, and every, everybody knows, that because they see him fall to pieces every time he's in the presence of Beatrice. But still, he insists on, on, on not divulging her name. He, it, it's an obsession. He becomes worried every time he thinks he might have, even when he's dreaming, did he utter her name so that others might have, have heard it. What I think he's hiding is something else entirely. I think he's hiding this abyss of subjectivity, which he is discovering, but you know, not fully acknowledging, perhaps, even to himself. There are some other symptoms of this. 
um, the focus on clothes, for example. Beatrice appears as her clothing, right? What he sees and what he records. You know, her, her crimson robe or white mantle. Um, you know, what's, what's underneath? Maybe there's a suspicion that, you know, beneath this image of her, there's nothing more substantial than reflection of his own wishing and projecting. It, I think this is always the case for us. What we have all of our fantasms. Um, I'm not trying to undermine, you know, the real existence of, of Beatrice, but we all fantasize, right, um, when we're face to face with, with, with the other. And I think he realizes that that fantastication comes out of some kind of an abyss of self-reflection within himself. He's discovering this. And dreams, I think, are a similar indication, revealing uh, an underlying nothingness that pertains to this subjective mode of apprehending her. The dream is revelatory and yet just an airy nothing. It functions both as revelation and as symptom, right, as Freud would teach us. Since the higher reality of the dream is at risk of vanishing into thin air is merely subjective, when it is subjected to reflection. But I want to consider especially the, the secretiveness here as opening up this newly discovered realm of, of subjectivity, which is so crucial for our whole modern culture. From early on, well, um, Dante, yeah, Dante says when he's questioned about, you know, who is your love, he would look back at his questioners and smiling say nothing. Right? He, he, he really wants to keep this secret. Um, but it's the supremely important process of self-reflection, I think, that is, it, it is what he, he feels attracted by, obsessed with, and uncomfortable about at the same time. This inner realm of experience is opened up to him by self-reflection, but since at the same time it is exposed as precisely a realm of self-reflection, that is, as a purely subjective act, it is unstable and it's susceptible of vanishing into nothing. It's nothing but this transitory subjective perception. So the elusiveness and vulnerability of the modern subject as purely a product of self-reflection is the legacy that is anticipated here and it will prove to be so essential to the making of the modern novel. The modern novel privileges a subjective point of view. I think this is really what distinguishes it from the ancient epic as you know, uh, heroic deeds in a public arena, or the medieval <coughs> romance as a, a series of marvelous adventures. It's not what really happens that counts in the novel, it's how the characters experience it and, and live it. This is, is, is really what brings on, I think, the whole genre. Right from the, the ur text, it, you know, Don Quixote is usually considered to be the first modern novel, even though I'm suggesting that the real Ur text here is, is the Vita Nuova, as, as really giving a new life to the novel and pointing it in this modernizing direction. But Don Quixote, I think, is, is very interesting in this regard. The protagonist's subjective interpretation of events is so extreme as to make him count as crazy, where he sees uh, windmills as giants. And this is what gives the impetus to everything that happens in the novel. You know, not, not to mention the meta-literary play of Cervantes, the author, with all of the, you know, the, the internal authors that he creates, and having the book itself be read by the characters in the book, the, you know, the, the first installment of, of the book. Um, this is how self-reflection really becomes the, the dominant note, you know, right from, from the beginning here. Now, the founding of the world of the novel on the subject makes it unstable for the subject taken simply in itself is a void. It's only by relations to others that this subject can take on substance and secure its existence. Dante discovers self-reflection as the creative principle of modern literature and new life, but therewith also the reflective self's precariousness. He dramatizes this insubstanti insubstantiality and nothingness of the subject, taken in itself, 
when he becomes absorbed in self-reproaches, I mentioned the episode of the God Bowl, um, right? He's humiliated uh, he, he, and vulnerable, helpless, this self-dissolution and, and undoing of himself. It, this is a Cavalcantian strain. Uh, Guido Cavalcanti, his slightly older contemporary, was, was a master in this genre, but Dante takes it over. Now, in this liability to annihilation through self-reflection, Dante is, is also a forerunner and of this other exemplar of modern self-consciousness, Hamlet, who is also apt to become absorbed in his own melancholic reflections, to be or not to be, and self-reproaches, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I, right, for leaving the dread command of his father's ghost unexecuted. These epic-making texts of the modern era are the Vita Nuova's heirs in the discovery of the nullity of the self in itself and its consequent breaking open to all possible plenitude in and through relationships with others. In each of these classic texts, the protagonists have to be beaten back symbolically and literally to the threshold of death before coming to this saving insight into their own constitutive and founding relation to an absolute or at least an absolutely shattering alterity. Through this relation, they discover their own, that their own egos, as enclosed by self-reflection, are null and void. And this epiphany then frees them to love and act with infinite commitment of their whole existence in relation to others. You know, for this, we, we have to look forward to the Commedia as well, which is the sequel to Dante's Teacher Moore. Dante has to keep his intimate feelings secret because his most authentic being is unveiled by self-reflection as consisting in nothing but self-reflection itself or a product thereof. So this is the scandal, right, that the emperor has no clothes. A pure interiority is nothing but pure pretense, yet this realization opens and orients itself beyond itself. The self breaks open to others, become susceptible to this commanding presence of the other. So you know, corresponding symmetrically with this empty self is also the uncanny holy other that you cannot grasp in, in any way. Um, it's reflection, this, this process of reflection which carries on really unendlessly. It shows us that whatever we conceive of as the object, whether it's God or, or Beatrice, um, or any other, we don't grasp in itself, right? It's always our impression. Uh, it's reflection then really liquidates that pure objectivity, just as it liquidates the pure subjectivity. This is the, the road that Dante is on. And you know, the real object of his love, after all, is only this ideal projected by his own inner reflection, right? Dante's Beatrice. I'm not, again, I, you know, I'll believe Boccaccio, who says that Beatrice was Beatrice Portinari. Uh, we're not, you know, I, I have no reason to deny that, but Dante's Beatrice, the one that he loves and, and, and worships, is his own figment. Now, uh, this realization about self-reflection as mediating all our conscious experience in the modern era is made the basis of modern subject-centered philosophy by Kant. He calls it the transcendental unity of apperception. And he's building on Descartes' cogito, the I think. Right? There's always this I think as the frame or filter of any cognition whatsoever. This is what modern philosophical reflection discovers, which I'm suggesting is being anticipated here by Dante. Everything in human consciousness, and, and that, you know, we can go forward then to, to, to Husserl, uh, the, phenomenal, the phenomenological reduction, uh, it's only what is immediately present to you, you know, none of that you know without doubt, and all, all the rest is, is inference, and all of that is then placed under, you know, in suspense. We have this already in, in, in Don Quixote. There's, there's a doubt as to whether his dulcinea exists. 
characters within the book and and outside of it as well. There's already, and I think there's this inkling of awareness of this abyss of self-reflection prescient already in Dante's closely guarded secret for, of his Beatrice. He intensifies then self-reflection to the point where it mediates the very existence of the ego and turns ultimately into a revelation of self transcendence. All right? Not the self, but rather something transcending and enabling it is in command of his own self-exposition. Reflection and revelation become inseparable. This, I submit, is Dante's fundamental bequest to modernity in its radical realization of a secularization of religious revelation. Right? Revelation of the subject to itself by self-reflection seems to give something immediate and graspable to be known. Right? Um, you know, just your immediate consciousness, and yet, that immediate consciousness, it, it too implodes and opens you then outward towards existence itself, the absolute of existence. Now, you know, I interpret this then, the, the, you know, the subject imploding and opening towards the infinite, I interpret that theologically. I think theology can give us a lot of insight into this existential experience. Um, others may prefer to understand that as only a secularized revealment or disclosure. In any case, I want to say that it is negatively theological, right? Since it relates to the all and infinite, which we cannot know. Negative theology, simply our knowing that we cannot know God. Um, that is, there, you know, there's always an element of transcendence. Uh, there, there are ways of knowing, experiencing. You know, Dante is, is showing us that, as does the New Testament as well. But there's always that margin of transcendence. And you know, so negative theology, then, is, is willing to forego always to, to give up whatever language, whatever concepts I used um, to say that no, God is something more than that, or existence is more than I've been able to conceive. Everything in the finite universe, then, once we enter into this perspective, is translucent in the light of a mystery that cannot as such be seen, but that nevertheless gives to be everything that is seen. See, we're seeing everything now in relation to Beatrice, or you know, whatever, um, that we realize we don't grasp it. All of life takes on a, a sacred dimension, or, or something that transcends us that we, we cannot we cannot grasp, but we are in relation to it. Right? All things are perceived and in a perspective of openness to their beyond, to their unlimited relations to other things. Everything opens up in this way. You know, literature takes us this direction. Everything that appears positively in our experience of the empirical world of sensory things is then understood as a negation of a higher reality that we relate to blindly in love and self-reflection, annihilating the self in itself and opening it in self-transcendence toward the other, such as Dante's text, models, and performs. Now a mesmerizing emblem this dialectical interpenetration of self-reflection and otherness, or imminence and transcendence, turns up in the Veronica. Dante alludes to it at the end of the Vita Nuova, in conjunction with pilgrims who are passing through Florence on their way to Rome in order to see the blessed image, the Imagine Benedetta of the Savior. The article in question is a cloth that because of the myth attached to it becomes the token of a transcendent reality. Its positive presence as a cloth, I need to show you this. Its positive presence as a cloth then covers over the infinite absence of the divinity that it's supposed to commemorate by having retained the imprint of Christ's face when Veronica wiped it for him along the way of the cross as he was mounting uh, Calvary towards Golgotha. This holy relic is treated according to a perhaps fanciful but widely accepted etymology at Dante's time as the true icon, vera icona, veronica. Right? 
the true icon of Christ. The Veronica thus presents a concrete object believed to carry the impress and to communicate the virtue of direct contact with divinity. As such, it embodies a typical sort of religious and ritualistic impulse, such as animates also theological poetry, celebrating transcendent beauty in human words and sens sensations, right? bringing it to something concrete. Religious rite, or poetry for that matter, projects true revelation of a transcendent truth on what is an artifact <coughs> and covers over the necessary constitutive emptiness of any purported divine presence. Rationally and reflectively considered, true divinity is infinite and cannot as such be made fully available in any merely finite object or representation. A passion for an absolute that is infinite, yet in finite terms necessarily empty, is transferred onto an iconic token that is concretely present. The self-reflected consciousness of modernity exposes this dialectic at work in the creation of religious myths that consequently are inhabited by an inherent insecurity. The contradictions of this dialectic lurk veiled already in Dante's often mystically elusive descriptions. Now, let's get back just a, a moment. We're almost there. As revealed after the fact, Dante's education in love and poetry in the Vita Nuova has been an induction into theology. The theology in question here arises on the tangible ground of human encounter with Beatrice, which catalyzes his self-reflection. Encountering Beatrice is Dante's initiation into his own individual and peculiar experience of the divine. The grounding of theological revelation in human encounter in Dante's magnum opus, and the divine comedy, appears here in the Vita Nuova in embryo. And in this sense, I take the Vita Nuova as an unsurpassed model for how literature in the modern era takes on a vocation of continuing and communicating religious revelation. Thus I propose understanding the Vita Nuova as an inauguration of the modern era, but of an alternative modernity such as we have never known. It challenges us to allow ourselves to be re-enchanted in our current age of disenchantment. Now I think maybe for for the sake of recapitulating, to be sure that we hang on to something, just two or three more strokes. Revelation is personal or relative to the subject and its incommunicable experience. To express and witness to this ineffable register of experience, the subject resorts to lyric language. Yet the subject constituted self-reflectively by this language is exposed by this very self-reflection as nothing in itself but only in relation to others. Only through relations can it anchor its abyss-like nothingness. Dante was eventually to include the whole cosmos in the universal network of relations that he constructs in the Commedia. Still, it all hinges on the transcendent absolute or divine other who is revealed to him, especially by Beatrice, without whom all is for naught. She opens an infinite dimension of mystery in relation to the infinite. Hers is the face that eternally faces colui qui est per omnia secula benedictus, he who is blessed, world without end. Amen. <laughs> It's always tricky with those early modern um, writers and, and thinkers because you can think of them as early modern, but you could also maybe, maybe, and, and I would like to hear what you think, think of them as late medieval. And, and, and I wonder what's at stake in, in that distinction for you. Um, and I was a little bit I was surprised to hear that uh, you are casting Dante here as almost a sort of the discoverer of self-reflection. Mm. When I, whenever you, you read that in Dante, I keep hearing Augustine 
all over the place, right? And we're talking about thousand years prior, right? And the whole confessional, of course, act of Augustine. And I would, I would uh, feel that in Augustine, self-reflection already exists as a temptation, to a significant degree inevitable, and the whole confessional sort of uh, a mode that he comes up with, Trinitarian fundamental, right? Where you, you confess to God, and then you, for the first time, are able to reflect on yourself because now sort of God gives it back to you, so to speak. Right. Um, yeah. And therefore you read Augustine as basically coming up with this theological buffer right. against something like modernity emerging. Right? And um, my question for you would be, could one, for example, read Dante similarly, not so much as the one who breaks into the brave modern world, and more in terms of somebody who is trying to guard Absolutely. something against that which is now inevitably breaking in, and yet he is not right. he is not so celebratory about that new chapter of Western uh, civilization as much as he's trying to uh, create this very complex hermeneutic yeah. that protects something of the past of the new Well, he's certainly not celebrating this new chapter, which hasn't been written yet, but he is opening the elements that are going to make it possible, and they're going to turn then you know, the tools that he furnishes in totally different, oftentimes opposite directions. I you know, totally agree that we, to read Dante, is, he is the you know, culmination of the Middle Ages, the ancient world. It's not an either or at all. I mean, you know, the whole periodization, it, it creates you know, some false schemas, which are useful for us, and yeah. I, I, that is a, you know, that's a kind of, of work that it, it is very important, and it's true that my approach here is really jumping over that. But, you know, if you try to periodize, as you're pointing out yourself, already in the early, you know, late antiquity with Augustine, right, where already we have a self-reflection, um, now, you know, then you can make some, some distinctions. Uh, it's not exactly the same. Um, and there, there are some, some aspects, really, of the kind of self-reflexivity that, that Dante discovers, which, which do then lead to some of these early modern figures. But it's something that's universal. I, in, in, in antiquity, uh, self-reflection didn't occur for the first time with Augustine, either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the very nature of, of human consciousness to be self-reflective. It expresses itself differently in all in all different ages. But it's true that you know, I'm, I'm using history as a kind of a, a muthos, I, I have to say. Uh, and because you know, it is interesting to see these connections between Dante and then modern novel and, and modern philosophy, but not at all to deny um, you know, taking him you know, as in another direction, looking back, or as you say, trying to preserve, definitely. And you know, I'm trying to preserve the, the insights of the Middle Ages and antiquity, a theological revelation for an age that has, has lost them to a considerable extent. But they come back in, in, in new ways, and that's what I'm interested in examining. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much for that. So I'm, I'm going to express a worry that starts with feminism, but really is ultimately um, a philosophical worry. Um, and so I'm worried about Dante's relationship with Beatrice mm -hmm. is ultimately depersonalizing for Beatrice, right? She, did, she, doesn't, she doesn't remain a person once she appears to him. Mm -hmm. She becomes an idealized figure. Uh, in fact, even her death doesn't even change that image so mm -hmm. much for him mm -hmm. uh, to the point that she's not attached to her own personality anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this sense, I see exactly what you're saying in the connection with Descartes uh, and even Kant, I think, uh, where there is the, the high risk of modern philosophy becoming entangled with solipsism, right? Once I experience other people through myself, are they actually people? Uh, or are they just uh, this openness of my, myself to my own experiencing of them? Um, and so I wanted to hear, because I, we've, we've talked about this before, I think it, it only finishes with theology again with Buber, 
right, okay. uh, with the actual second person right. dimensional law. Right. Uh, and I wanted to see if you yeah. have anything in Dante already of that. Well, my response to this is, sure, you know, he is then blending out the particularity and the personality of this woman, and um, you know, that's very important to, to feminism and to, to all of us in, in very different ways. Um, but if we put all of the emphasis on Beatrice as this particular individual, or if on ourselves and our identities, we're going to blend out something else, which is this transcendent dimension, which is maybe necessary for us to deal with one another as the personalities that we are, as the men and women that we are. Are we going to divide you know, into opposing genders, or are we going to have some sort of a transcendent dimension where, where, we, where we are one? I want not to lose that, um, to try and bring that into focus. I agree that it has to be combined with these, you know, re relationship was sort of the, the vocabulary that I was evoking there, and it's true that the Vita Nuova is somewhat short, uh, you know, actual relationship, it, except for this absolute relationship. Yeah, the country. Do you come into on that if you want to ask? Yeah, please. No, no. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, first of all, I want to like to start with uh, a fact. Uh, that is, uh, William's wife's name is Beatrice, of course. <laughs> so we need to start from that point, I think, that facts and real people are important. Uh, so, as we know, Beatrice Portinari was a real person, but as you were... Uh, say, saying before, of course, Dante took her and gave her um, an, an idealized uh, perspective as we leave others uh, in a subjectivity, uh, subjective way. Um, I want to thank you very much for um, pointing out uh, again that I, I started thinking about it. Uh, the fact that the um, Beatrice, when Dante presented, is connected uh, to the daughter of God from Homer, not from the Bible. So this is an important point, I think, because uh, so he decided, of course, not to, because the only woman in uh, a Christian uh, um, Christianity who was created by God is he, Eve, and of course uh, he doesn't Dante does not choose Eve, he chose Elena, which is a very peculiar character. Yes. And I mean, she was uh, the beginner, basically, of the yeah, actually very, very beautiful, but Venus was as well. Uh, she was basically the initiator in some way, the trigger of the war, the, Tro the Troy War, right? So it's not uh, uh, let's say positive character in mythology so why to choose Elena and I thought about it Elena was born by a god Zeus Jupiter but the Jupiter had so many daughters I mean we know that he was a, a, a repetitive lover a, let's say a serial lover Hera was not very happy about it but Zeus, uh, El Elena was born from Zeus and Leda, and she was born, uh, Elena, from an egg. And that is the key, I think, because the egg is the symbol of resurrection, the symbol of reincarnation, the symbol of rebirth. And is the symbol also of the Holy Spirit that imbued the world around us, and that basically make the revelation inside every human being. In fact, she is described like the Holy Spirit. When she passed, she basically start a revelation in every person. And so this uh, is something that. I think it's it's triggered this thought in me. Okay, no, thank you for that elaboration on that on that image. I thought that this was going to be maybe 
a, you know, an objection to Christian appropriation. Let's go. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I thought it might be going that direction. I didn't really hear that then. Yeah, but in any case, it's a uni you know, universal mythology. Is, right. is absolutely But the Dante relevant. always re-Christianized all the mythological uh, myths. But in that case, he does say it, 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 it's Homer. Um, uh, yeah. it, um, and he's okay with that, actually. Yeah. And of course, we have Greek and Roman mythology are part of the other world that he experiences. Yeah. Right? Um, but just to think of the way in which, for example, he takes all the monsters from mythology and re-propose it in the Divine Comedy as a Guardians, right? That's right. It's not problematical for him, I think, because he realizes by self reflect by you know reflection that these are all elements in our culture that impinge on our experience and perception. And you know, they're not objective realities pure and simple. It's a hermeneutic filter that he's representing when he goes into hell, what he sees there. Uh, these are all parts uh, you know of, of what we experience. We have these images from the classical tradition as well as from the biblical tradition. He doesn't separate, you know, the one is true and the other is false. It's not like that. They're all part of our experience and maybe no imagery or imaginary is true per se, right? Um, this is the negative theological point. It's only a representation of something that transcends any language and any cultural vocabulary. Thank you very much for that. Maybe there are, there are other comments or could I have one more? Yes, please. Okay. That'll be my second. Would that be all right? Okay. Yes. Building on this classical tradition, um, of course in the com uh, divine, divine uh, comedy, um, Virgil doesn't get to to go all the way up, right? Um, and um, I wonder if you, if, if you could tell us a little bit about the status of self-reflection uh, for Dante on the continuum from uh, the new life and then uh, and then the Divine Comedy. Does it, anything change, or is that the same Dante, the same experience, is just sort of transposed onto that text? Um. Let's see, is this you know, virtual? It's often taken to be an allegory of reason and even you know, some kind of a, a perfection of reason. Maybe one of the conclusions we should draw is that self-reflection does not save you. Um, you know, it is, I think it is crucial for Dante's whole process. Uh, but you can self-reflect yourself into hell and stay there, and he has examples. And even in the Paradis, he mentions Arios and Sabinios, some of the great heritage. You know, Arius would be a perfect example of someone who relies on reflection even to deny the doctrine of the Trinity because it's illogical, right? One God cannot be three persons. Uh, any logician would know that, and Arius was quite a logician. So, you know, um, self-reflection is really not a, a panacea. It's sort of, it's inevitable for us. Um, and Dante is able to use it in order to, to open a space for the holy and, and even for salvation. Um, but we can also use it, right, the, 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 the demons. And in fact, um, it's worse when they have perverted reason. They, you know, that's in lower regions of, of hell. So it's, you know, it, it's very, very ambiguous, um, equivocal, self-reflection. It's, it's been the curse of modernity, right, as, as well as opening a path for recuperating the holy. Um, it's more often than not been perverted to narcissism. And, and Dante foresees that as well. But he redeems narcissism. In the 30th canto of each of the canticles, right, there's, there's the reference to Narcissus in Canto 30 of the Inferno. Le carri, no? Lo specchio di Narciso, Mastro Adamo. Here we have. Adam, but then there's a, a reprise in the 30th canto of Purgatorio. Dante sees himself in the stream, and, and there's a self-reflection. He he has to repent and renounce his sins. But in Paradiso, then you have the you know, the the image of the the, the mountain, il chivo, hill, reflecting itself. This is the blessed. Uh, there's a re the, the blessed are reflecting themselves, and God Himself is 
a redeemed Narcissus, reflecting himself in his perfect image, his son. So, you know, there is a, a narrative, a counter narrative to Ovid's about the redemption of Narcissus through self reflection running through the Comedia. Well, good. All right.